Welcome, future lawyers. I'm Celeste Pagano Bowles. I'm here with uh, my fellow instructor, Nate Stein, and we are delighted to present to you our second ever 1L webinar. These webinars are designed to help guide you through the 1L process. Uh, so that's what we're going to do here today. And a very important part of that process is, of course, um, case reading. Um, and I'm just pulling up my notes. You, yeah. So um, we are delighted to have you here. I'm Celeste Pagano Bowles. I am the content director and the um, and the director of instruction at Barmax, but that really includes the Barmax and One L products. I am a graduate of Harvard Law School and a former law professor and lawyer myself, and now I teach uh, for Testmax. Um, and today really brought me back to the first year of law school, uh, and I will tell you that. Getting to the first year of law school felt like landing in a foreign country without a guide. And the language sounded like maybe it, it was somewhat familiar, but it wasn't. I did not understand the language or even the structures and forms of communication that people around me seemed to be using with facility. And my professors seemed to expect that I would know. And by working with those forms and stumbling around and picking up the new vocabulary and ways of thinking, I did gain fluency in legal language and legal thought and the forms and the way we communicate and think in the law. But I think the process would have been a whole lot easier if I'd had a guide along the way. Um, and if I had sought a little more guidance before going in. So that's what 1L is here for. You may know Test Max from our LSAT product, LSAT Max, which helped many people to maximize their LSAT score. And uh, you may have also heard of Bar Max, which has helped thousands to pass the bar exam, that final hurdle to the goal of becoming a lawyer. Uh, but we're also here for law students. We have something called 1L which is law school content. And I'm gonna show that to you, the product, the resources that we offer to first year law students. Um, and you can see those resources here. We have lectures and outlines in many of the common first year subjects. Um, you know, you see torts and contracts right in here. I'm sure most of you are taking that and crimes, which is criminal law. We have the lawn of flash flashcards, many multiple choice practice questions, practice essays, which we'll talk about in a future webinar, and case notes, legal briefs. So this package is available $24.95 a month. Um, and we also offer tutoring. We offer one-on-one -on -one tutoring. This is the same high quality tutoring that we offer to our bar exam students. We are offering it at a lower price to law students right now. These are our basic prices. If you know that you're going to want a little bit more one-on-one -on -one guidance, um, then go ahead and take advantage of that. These free webinars, um, I think they will eventually be posted to the TestMax YouTube page. So that should happen soon. Um, and I think we will make links available, but I'm not sure when Katie may know about that. Anyway, so let's get back to that foreign language, shall we? <laughs> that language of the law. What are these legal opinions anyway that you are required to read? You are given a, a case book and there's some explanatory stuff, but the vast majority of that book seems to be comprised of these legal opinions and why. First of all, I want you to notice that they are appellate opinions. Even that makes this not the normal practice of law. If you think about the normal practice of law, people have a dispute. 
You know, lawyers start writing letters back and forth. They threaten to sue each other, right? This is the civil cases that you'll encounter in most of your um, classes. You will encounter criminal cases in your criminal law class. And that is different. Instead of having a plaintiff suing a defendant, you're going to have a, pr a prosecutor or the state uh, sue, um, you know, trying a defendant for a crime. So you've probably got some understanding of the differences. But in all of these, it's helpful for us to remember that in law school, in your first year of law school, you're not reading the basic trial court opinion most of the time. First of all, not even all trials end in an opinion, uh, but many do. Uh, certainly at the federal level, trials end in an opinion. But then if there's something about that opinion where the law is in dispute, that's the sort of thing that will be appealed and will may find its way into a case book one day. <laughs> So what we have here is, a, you know, this is a case you may encounter in contracts. It's a fun case. This guy managed to get his hand on some very cheap fur coats. Um, so if you remember the fur coat guy, this is that case. And if not, you'll probably run into this guy in your contracts class soon. Um, but let's just look at these parts of the case. And then we're going to rely on Nate to dig a little more deeply into how to brief and how to um, understand the, um, you know, the pieces of the analysis that really matter. Um, but hey, let's understand what's going on here for. Where are we, right? That's what I needed to know when I landed in that foreign country that was law school. Where are we? What's going on? Who are these people? I think it's helpful to get that background information. And if it's too basic for you, hopefully it'll help someone. Um, all this stuff up here, we can consider the caption, uh, particularly, um, you know, the name of the case. So here we have our plaintiff, Lefkowitz, suing our defendant. Oh, I'm using a um, common law school notation, which is P for plaintiff and D for defendant, which that no longer means change, right? In, in undergrad, depending on what you majored in, Delta may have meant change. And here it means defendant. You can also write P and D, but just some of your professors will write pi and delta, so you want to have that ready in your head. Um, so we have a plaintiff and a defendant, and we have what court we're in. That's always helpful to know, because sometimes, like, let's say we have a federal case, the trial court would be a district, and the um, appellate court would be a circuit, and then if it got appealed again to the top of the ladder, well we'd be hearing from the Supremes, uh, not the singers, the uh, Supreme Court justices, and it would be the Supreme Court of the United States. So here we have the Minnesota Supreme Court. How do we know it's Supreme? How do we know that's not just a Minnesota um, appellate court? Well, one, it says so here, and often if it, um, yeah, just the name of the state is often the Supreme Court reporters although that can vary. So we've got our court. We know where we are. We know who our people are, but we're in an appeal type of situation. So we have to understand who won and who lost down below to understand who's appealing. Well, it turns out that um, our plaintiff, Mr. Lefkowitz, uh, is the respondent. That means that he won down below. And the appellant, which would then be the store, is appealing and saying, hey, I disagree with the lower court's decision. If somebody wins, they don't appeal. So our loser at the trial court is going to appeal. So you can see them called appellant and appellee is a common word. Appellant and appellee. And um, 
with the accent on the last syllable there. Oh, I had a student in my legal writing class who would talk to me about the appellate court. He was a very good reader, but he didn't know it's appellate, right? And he was a very smart guy and I had to correct him, but you know, you don't know what you don't know, appellant, appellee, but here it's appellant responded. And sometimes you'll read old historical cases where it's plaintiff in error and defendant in error, which is confusing because it might have been we had the plaintiff and defendant above plaintiff one. So now the one appealing is the defendant called plaintiff in error. Well, that's awfully confusing if nobody ever explained it to you. But that's just an old word for appellant plaintiff in error. And appellee, an old word for that would be defendant in error. So if you're ever confused about that, which I was, I did not understand how the positions of the parties could have switched. It seems so simple if you speak the language. But if you don't, I, I was quite lost my first semester of law school, and I now have no shame in admitting that. Um, the other thing you'll notice at the beginning of these cases, two more things. One is the citation. Okay, this is our citation. That's just where it lives in the books. And we could actually have fun with this. I don't have a background on right now. I'm really supposed to. I'm really supposed to put the one that shows off 1L, but I'm going to have a little more fun and I'm going to do this instead. Okay, can you see my background? I hope so. Um, okay. So we'll close that. I think you've got my background. Um, now I'm in a law library. Isn't that fabulous? The teleportation abilities that Zoom has given us. Um, these virtual books behind me are reporters, legal reporters, and they show all of the uh, case opinions that have been reported from some particular court or group of courts. So this these little numbers here, they're not random. They tell me which book it's in and which page, which book. So this particular case is in something called the Northwest Reporter. And again, you'll get to know them, but that's what that is. The Northwest Reporter, uh, this, um, the second, you know, the running of it, the 86th volume. Okay, 86 volume of the second set of Northwest reporters and they go in order chronologically and then 689. So you can walk into a library, find the Northwest reporters, pull out, you know, Northwest second book number 86, flip to page 689 and you'll find this case. You probably won't have to do that. Um, what I'm showing you here is a free online version of the case. You can find things online and you'll in law school, you'll be doing research using uh, expensive paid databases that they give you for free, like drug dealers giving samples um, <laughs> to get you hooked. Um, but there are free online resources as well that you will learn to use if you are not somewhere that pays the big bucks for those databases, which is fine. Um, anyway, if you ever need the books, that's all those numbers mean. So we have the title, the caption, we know the court, and we know the judge, Justice Murphy of the Minnesota Supreme Court. So we know where we are and who we're dealing with. That's nice, isn't it? It's nice to know. Um, and you can do this for every case. By the way, sometimes it's just the letter J in some case books. It can be judge or justice, or it could be CJ for chief justice. Um, if the chief justice wrote that opinion, um, you know, or it, in the older cases, it might be a chancellor or something like that from jolly old England. I thought the letter stood for their first initial. And I don't know how long it took me to get suspicious of the fact that so many of the judges had first names that began with J. No, it wasn't Judy or James. It was, or, you know, anyone else, Juan and Jamal, whatever. It was not the name of the judge. It just stood for judge. Nobody told me, so I didn't know. Took me a while to catch on. All right. So that's all of the introductory stuff. That's not 
the main part of what your professor is going to ask you about, which is probably why I missed it. But it is good for you to know so that you have your bearings when you land in this um, neighborhood of this new country of the, called the law. Um, here, we have the major parts of the opinion. And this is a fun one, and it's pretty short, so there we go. Um, I'm just going to point them out to you, and Nate will use a different case to talk to you about really how to read those, okay? Um, so here we go. We start with facts, okay? All of this is the actual facts that happened that led to the dispute between the parties, okay? And um, without getting into them, we can look at some keywords. This grows out, this case grows out of the re alleged refusal of the defendant to sell to faint plaintiff, blah, 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 okay? This case grows out of this event that I'm about to describe here in these next few paragraphs, says the judge. Before that, we have some procedural facts. So some, uh, some people call this the procedural posture. Uh, some people call this uh, procedural facts. Uh, it's basically what's been going on in the lawsuit up until now. It tells us this is an appeal from an order of the Municipal Court of Minneapolis denying the motion of the defendant for amended finding of facts or for a new trial. Okay. It tells us that this is an appeal that it where the defendant filed a motion that was denied. So that helps us know the defendant is not happy because uh, its motion was denied and there was a judgment for the plaintiff. Okay, and then we have the actual on the ground facts and we have the trial court's decision. Okay, they don't always go into detail about what the trial court decided, but they do in some cases and they do here. So there's the trial court's decision. And um, as I said, these are the facts. All right. Then after the facts, they don't always follow the prescribed order. There's no law that says they have to, but they usually do. This is how the buildings are structured in this new foreign country called the law. And so when we walk in, we know there's an entryway here and usually the living room's on the left and, you know, and so forth, right? Um, so that's kind of how you see it. This is usually how they set it up. Some uh, will get creative. Um, or your case book is so edited that it doesn't include the entire opinion. And so it's a little choppier. Um, that's another possibility. Here, we have defendant contends, defendant relies on. These are the defendant's arguments. And in here is an issue, okay? In here is a legal issue. So you'll read this. You'll isolate the legal issue, which we're not going to do now. Nate will help you with that. But we have legal arguments and an issue in here. Sometimes they will state the issue out front. Here it's in this section of argument. Here's what the defendant thinks the law should be. And then we have some analysis. All of this is the judge's own analysis. And you can see it relies on past authorities. It posits a rule. Okay, it gives us a rule. Okay, and it elaborates on that rule. Okay, it gives me another authority. So there's a lot of parts to this analysis. It gives me another authority, the most recent case on this subject. Okay, these are precedents. Precedents, what? 
when a court cites another case, good to think about why. Because what is the court doing with that case? They're either going to say, this case is good law, this prior case, this different facts, different people, and I'm going to show how it should apply here. So that's application, applying the, the precedent case. The court may be distinguishing the precedent case. Ah, oh, I have a case over here, but in today's case, the facts are different. So a court can apply, distinguish, or entirely reject a precedent. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you're the Supreme Court of Minnesota and some lower court has said that a rule is this or that or the other, and that case stood, and you think that case was wrongly decided and we are the Supreme Court of Minnesota, we decide what the law here is Minnesota and what it's about. Um, I'm sorry, had to, it was Minnesota. Um, then we say, we're going to reject that prior case and maybe even overturn it. Okay. Um, we can overturn that prior case if we are a, a court superior to the one that made that case, or if it's in the past and we say, okay, that is no longer good law. We've evolved. That's no longer good law. We're going to reject that rule entirely. And that rule will be out the window. So is the court applying, distinguishing, or in some way rejecting the prior case? That is very important to notice because sometimes there will be two paragraphs that describe this prior case and the reasoning of the prior case in detail. And if you stumble into it and you think that's your judge's reasoning, but then it turns out in the next paragraph, the judge says, those judges didn't know what they were talking about. <laughs> That's a terrible rule. You don't want to fall for it. You don't want that. You don't want to it confidently announce in class that that's the rule when it's the rule that the um, court is rejecting. And then um, some more analysis. Yet another argument that the defendant raises and here the court disposes of that one pretty quickly. So sometimes you'll have to keep track of more than one argument. Um, and then we get to a holding, okay? Well, the holding is actually, the main holding is in here, the main holding on the main point, okay? Uh, we think that the trial court was correct in holding that there was in the parties a sufficient mutuality of obligation to constitute a contract of sale. Holding, there was a contract here, okay? And the reasoning and the rule as to why are up here in the, analysis. I know I kind of sped through that really quickly. And then, you know, there's another argument attacked on the end, but it's, um, you know, Nate will walk through this in more detail with a, a, a torts case that you will probably also encounter um, a very uh, popular torts case in class. So I'm going to toss this over to Nate in a minute here. Let me yeah, I want to just say one great thing about Nate. I didn't introduce you at the beginning. Hi, Nate. Hi, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> just so much. Jumped in. But Nate is really well positioned to teach this particular webinar because he is our one player in the whole uh, Bar Max roster who, or Test Max roster, who does both the LSAT and the Bar. He teaches LSAT students, in fact, just came out of a cycle of teaching the LSAT. So teaching reading skills for the LSAT is a big part of what Nate does. And I said, Nate, I know this relates to how they should be reading cases in class. And I want you to be the one to talk about it. And Nate yeah, is also just a wonderful tutor and he's available for one else. So with that, I introduce Nate. Hi everyone, thank you, Celeste. Um, really good. Thank you for the introduction and uh, really good points. And I definitely wanted to start off to say I 100% agree with everything that Celeste said about being in law school, feeling like it's a little bit of a different planet, but especially um, that's just a whole new language. And I think just learning anything new or learning any skill on earth or going into any profession, 
a big part of it is learning the language. I mean, I can imagine maybe watching a basketball game or reading a summary of a baseball game or reading about economics. It's like, I don't know that you expect someone who doesn't know basketball to read a, a summary of a basketball game and know what like field goal percentages or like how many three pointers someone made. Same with economics, not going to know about interest rates or like reserve rates or anything like that. And so learning these terms is so key to even um, being able to really understand anything at all. And so um, it, it comes with time. And at first it's a little bit steep, the learning curve where you like, just like Celeste was saying, there's three different ways to say a Pelly or whatever it is. And it's kind of the same across the board, but that's across, that's true of every profession. So um, do your best to learn if you can take notes and write down every word that you don't know. And if you're me, you'll once again, I mean, write down every word you don't know, either look it up later, but also write down the definition at some point. If you're me, you'll, you'll then forget it again and have to reread it and relearn it and check the definition. But at some point, the, the act of checking the definition and writing down the word, right, finding the definition, writing down the definition, it really helps commit it to memory. And over time, after your first semester, second semester, you'll really get the hang of it. It just takes some time and practice. You just have to put the effort in. Um, every lawyer you know, every law professor you know, every judge, every famous judge or lawyer on TV, they all went through the same process. So it's everyone started from zero at some point. Um, so it's not like uh, impossible. It's not like if you feel like you're struggling, it's, it's not like it's something new or different or it's uniquely hard for you. That's just how it is. <clears throat> um, yeah, and so as Celeste was saying, um, oh yeah, and just the same as Celeste was saying as well, I think it's so important to have some sort of knowledge coming into law school or prep work outside of law school because it's just so different. And I don't always think that law professors' first interests, or maybe that it's been so long since they've been to law school, or like Celeste was saying, this kind of brings us back to our first year and, and we forget about all these things we went through and had to overcome in terms of understanding law um, and becoming lawyers. I think law professors also kind of forget that as well. And so they can be so hyper-focused on teaching contracts, let's say, that they don't realize that their students don't even really know that all the cases in their case but are appellate uh, opinions or, or something like that. Like just some, these, some things seem so basic to them. They don't realize that like uh, other people don't have this knowledge at all. So I think just someone helping you, someone being your guide, someone being there, uh, like to help you understand all the little steps that get you to the foundation you need to be able to walk around on like the stage of being a lawyer, let's say, um, like help you build that bridge from point A to point B where you're just a student to when you understand the law and can be a lawyer. Um, I think it's, it's really helpful. And I do wish I had more of that. And I do wish, I wish that was kind of just part of the law school curriculum. Um, I think that's just a little bit overlooked and it really shouldn't be. And that's actually kind of want to, what I want to start with today, it's, um, I, we're going to get into briefing in just a minute, but why do we even do, why do we even read cases at all? And um, so, and I'm not sure if I totally fully understood that this as well for myself when I first entered law school, um, but the U.S. law system is based on a system of precedence where um, the law is written by the legislature or, or, or whoever, and um, it doesn't, it's not always super clear on every single point. And so uh, it, it can't literally like list out every situation, right? And so what actually has to happen is the judges then receive a case in front of them with the facts and every fact, every case is just slightly unique. And they have to say, okay, this law applies to this case in this way. And it comes out with this result because, I mean, you have to write an infinite number of laws for infinite, infinite number of human situations. And so the judge then says, okay, with this law, this is how we apply it to the facts. This is how we, we make these decisions based on this law. And then that sets, and then they write out their opinion as a legal case. And that's what we'll be reading today. And that sets the precedent for the next judge to follow. Okay, I understand that this judge decided that this law literally means this. Yeah, or like, here's the literal language of the law. This is how it works when it's applied. This is allowed, this is not allowed. One classic example that you might hear when you first go to law school is uh, there, there's an ordinance that says, that says there's no vehicles allowed in this park. And so, okay, the first person to ever get in trouble with this, let's say uh, someone gets arrested driving a bicycle in the park or gets a fine, let's say. And it goes to the judge and the judge says, actually, bicycle does not count as a vehicle under the, the language of the law. So this doesn't count. 
And the judge writes an opinion and says, this law, no vehicles allowed in the park, does not include bicycles. And so the next judge then follows that. And if anyone else ever gets a ticket for being on a bicycle, they can say, no, look, the law is applied according to this case, um, doesn't, doesn't apply to bicycles. Now, then someone else comes in front of the case. And they've been now uh, fined for putting up a, uh, for driving a remote controlled car in the park. And then the next judge has to say, okay, this law does not apply to bicycles and it also does not apply to remote controlled cars. And so now that becomes the law. This precedent is also part of the law. And uh, judges then have to follow this. And lawyers who are representing this client have to come up in front of the judge and say, you know, I've seen these cases in the past. It doesn't apply to bicycles. It doesn't apply to remote controlled cars. My client, who has now been fined for putting up um, a replica of a World War II tank in the park, it shouldn't also apply to them because of this, this, and this. And then the judge needs to say, and a good lawyer will then say, hey, my case is similar to these cases or different from these cases or distinguished from these cases. Um, and this is how the judge should, should decide. And that's, that's sort of like the whole basis of the case method and why we do the case method because the law itself doesn't matter as much. Like you can get your little book of every single statute in New York, New York State, let's say. But it, that's not going to be as useful in law school or not going to be as relevant to how these statutes are actually applied to the, the cases that the judge see in front of them. And then that is very relevant to being a lawyer. And part of the skill of being a lawyer is to say, hey, this law has been applied this way. And they've said, you know, bicycles are allowed in the park, but, you know, replicas of actual you know, tanks are not allowed in the park. My case is more similar to this one and less similar to this one. And the other side, the prosecutor's side or the, the defense side or whatever, will say, no, it's more similar to that one and not this one. And that's sort of the basis of all law, finding cases that are similar to you that will help you while distinguishing or making yourself distinct from or changing or, or making your facts seem different or, or uh, separate from um, bad results, let's say, from, from cases that the law would come down the other way against your side. And that's sort of the whole reason we do the case method. We have to read about how it's been applied. And often you'll get in law school, you'll get assigned cases in pairs. So Celeste just did the case, um, Lefkowitz versus uh, Great Minneapolis surplus store, I think it was. So it's a case about um, like a department store made an an advertisement that said, you know, a coat for $100 or something like that. And someone came in and said, I want this coat for $100. And the judge says, okay, that's actually a contract. There's another case that actually some of you might remember. Um, it was called Leonard versus PepsiCo, Pepsi-Cola, in which they say um, Pepsi at one point, 20 years ago, actually, when I, when I was young, well, I actually could have done this. I could have been this kid. Uh, a kid had uh, collected enough, like, box tops or like points or like soda tabs that he could technically have won the grand prize in this Pepsi contest that was like a fighter jet, like an actual like military fighter jet. And he, Pepsi said, no, you know, obviously we were joking when we put out that advertisement that you can win a, um, a fighter jet. And uh, the, they went to court, the kids sued, they went to court and Pepsi won. They said, obviously this was a joke. Now, those two cases, the Lefkowitz case and the PepsiCo case, are quite similar in a lot of ways. And a good lawyer who's trying to def, um, represent their client to say, hey, this is a contract, would have to somehow make, make their case seem more similar to the Lef Lefkowitz case and less similar to the PepsiCo case. I hope I didn't say that backwards. I might have. But what I'm trying to say is we often see cases like this in pairs in law school where you read two in which the law kind of came out one way versus the other way. And we kind of have to try to think about what makes these different. What distinguishes, what facts distinguish these cases or what other uh, considerations distinguish these cases? And so it's super important to even understand why we do this at all. And so the reason we brief is to understand how judges make the decisions they do and then how as lawyers we can apply the law or have the law apply in a good way to our cases and even understand the law at all and the advice and all this stuff. Um, I hope that's clear. And one thing I want to add to this is... Uh, there's a format, which I think some of you may know, or some, um, I was unfamiliar with when I first came into law school, called IRAC, which is um, a format for writing. 
And it's like, I didn't really have much actual like logic based writing experience when I first came into law school. And I think this would be also a really important thing to understand. Um, but legal writing is very logic based. And you have to say this happens and this happens and we have this conclusion. And Celeste is saying she's going to teach IRAC in a later webinar. But the reason this is so key is because these judges have also learned to write in the IRAC method. And I just want to say, just as a brief touching on this point, for uh, law school exams and for the bar exam, you'll be writing in the IRAC method, which is you write out the issue. The issue is whether this is a contract for this fighter jet, uh, for these Pepsi pop tabs or whatever. The rule is that there's a contract if there's blah, blah, blah. The application is here. Um, you know, there was or was not a contract because these facts and these facts. And, then, and finally, in conclusion, the C for conclusion, it's IRAC, issue, rule, application, and conclusion. My conclusion is that this should be a contract or something like that. And the reason this is important is because ju judges are somewhat, not 100%, because there's no, you know, there's no law for them to write this way. But ideally, uh, you'll be able to read in a legal uh, case what the conclusion is, let's say, and I'll just work backwards from here. If you see the conclusion, ideally right before that will be the, the, the rationale or the application of the law to the facts and how they reach the conclusion. And then right before that, you might be introduced to the rule that's relevant to this case and the issue. And then before that, as Celeste pointed out, you might see facts, you might see procedural history and all this stuff in general. And it's not always going to be in a great order, but if you get this understanding of that's what we're looking for, we're looking for the rationale um, we're looking for the rule, uh, how it's applied to the case, how it's applied to these facts, what's the rationale, and then finally the conclusion that sums up how this all works together cohesively. That's, uh, in general, why what we're looking for as we're doing it. And I, um, as Celeste was saying, this does connect to reading for the L uh, LSAT, because I do, I do think that a lot of us read in life. For the decades we've been reading, we, we generally read to learn something or for pleasure or to uh, pass some time or to read a good story. And it's all about the content of what you're reading, like the what, the what of the story. But I think for the, for the LSAT and for law school um, and for being a lawyer, what is also relevant is like the why or the structure, the, the why or the how, like how is the, the case shaped? Why are they putting these paragraphs in this order? Why are they saying this and then this? Not just what they're saying, but why have they said these things in this way? And that's what I think is really key to, um, to going into case briefing. And I wanna discuss with you a bit what we're gonna look for, and then we're gonna go into this case. Um, we're going into Simmons versus Tice, which is a really famous torts case. I just wanna to touch on a couple of things and then we're gonna go straight into that. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen here, hope this works. And I'm gonna, uh, I think you will then see a couple of things. And so here's what I wanna say as we go into this. What are we, going to be looking for. Here's what we're going to be looking for. We're looking for this idea that uh, uh, we can kind of notice similar features across the board every time we read a legal case. And so in advance, I want these to be the things we're looking for as we read and as we brief. And here's what I want to suggest. As you're reading and briefing a case for law school, at least at the very beginning, um, and I this can take a while, so maybe even before you start law school or the first couple of days. I would say you probably should, should read each case multiple times. Times. And maybe in general, you might want to read, uh, read it once, um, then read a second time and, and try to brief it in this time. And briefing is figuring out what the holding was, what the issue is, um, what the law is, all this different stuff. And then I would often, in, in my own personal experience as I was briefing, I would also look it up. I would also do my best to look it up online or in a book. And just to double check what I understood with the case versus what the, the real answer was. And sometimes I was pretty far off. And so I would definitely suggest this, at least when you first start. And then I would even give it one more read. And now this is going to take a while. And even if you just skim this last time, it's totally fine. But I just want you to, what you kind of do is, you've probably gotten some parts wrong and some parts right. I would then just reread and just apply what you just learned. Oh, I read that as holding, but it should have been dictated, this type of stuff. And I know this is going to take a while, but I would just do it for the first couple of cases 
And then you might have to drop it off later uh, as you run out of time and you're signing more reading and this and that. But I would just say this is just to help you even learn how to do it at all at first. And then you'll, then you'll really start to get the hang of it. Um, I think that's super important. And I would say as you go, you might want to brief your cases. There's a bunch of different ways to brief your cases. You might want to do it in like an online Google Doc where you uh, um, can just add to it as the semester goes on. And then by the end, you can just kind of compress your notes from the Google Doc into your final outlines that you would use for exams and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, so I think that's kind of clear. And, and here, here's, what, uh, here's what we're going to be looking for as we're reading this case coming up. And what I want to say is let's look for these things in advance. And it'll help us really understand uh, what's going on in the case. So we're going to be reading for uh, not just what is going on, not just what or our content, um, but also the why. Oh, I should even say the why or the how, which is the structure. And here are some key terms to figure out what that why or how is or what that structure is. And so uh, first at the start, a case as Celeste had already, has already pointed out, the case is gonna have like the caption and the case ID at the top. So here's the list of things I want us all to look for as we're reading. And um, I can kind of read it and maybe, I'm not sure if we can do too much audience, audience participation, but I want everyone to kind of read along for themselves and, and see if they can identify all these things. I would even say, maybe try to take notes on this for yourself and, and look for these types of things as we read cases in general. At some point, they're also going to give us the facts of the case, which what ha was what happened actually that led to there being this lawsuit or whatever that brought them into court today. And to, by today, I mean 50 years ago or whatever these cases are from. Uh, we want to look at the procedural history. And these, these notes I'm giving you are going to be common features throughout almost every case you read. And so keep your eye out for these things. And knowing about these things in advance is very helpful um, to understanding what you're reading the first time. They're also going to bring up the issue in the case, which could be both an issue of law and of fact. So we could have an issue of law, in which case, does this law about motor vehicles or vehicles mean only motor vehicles or does it mean bicycles also? And it could be an issue of fact. Did the person actually bring the motor vehicle into the park or was it outside of the park? And so like, does the law or the fact uh, make a difference here in deciding the case. And so there's, I guess, multiple types of the issue itself. So keep an eye on that. Um, we need to think about each party's argument. You know, I did, uh, we did reach a contract. And the other, uh, other side says, no, there never was a contract for this, that, you know, X, Y, and Z reason. Um, we're also going to be reading for what is the actual rule of, uh, law. What is the actual rule here? The contract is, you know, when we have an offer and acceptance or something like that. And how does it apply here? Um, and then we're going to look for also, what is the court's holding, which is their final decision? And then we also want to look for the court's rationale. And at some level, um, these holdings, these issues, these this holding, this rationale, this application, as I just discussed, and Celeste will talk about it at a different time, well, some, at some level, fit this sort of format in which we have a an issue at play, which is, in this case would be the facts or the issues at, uh, as we discussed here and here. Then we'll have the rule of law, like the law says, we have a contract that is offered acceptance. At some point, we'll say, what, would, um, what is the application of this law to this situation? And this is a very general format that we just can kind of keep in our head in general, but you'll need it for the long term. And at some point, we're going to have a conclusion or a final holding, like this case thus comes out for the plaintiff because X, Y, and Z reason. Um, so just always want to keep that in mind. I always want to refer back to that. And the court's rationale um, has a couple of different, couple of different parts. The judge could be uh, analyzing a line of precedent cases. You know, because of this precedent, we have to come out this way. Um, they could also be discussing um, another possible rule. Uh, maybe I said possible, but I don't know. Another possible rule. For example, in the case of the coat that we were discussing, the coat contract and the 
PepsiCo contract that could say, you know, under the Lefkowitz line of cases, left, uh, don't put me on the spot when it comes to spelling, please, or the PepsiCo line of cases, it would come out this way, but the other rule is this way. So they might be discussing two different rules for the same thing. Um, they also might be uh, discussing possibly um, policy reasons. You know, we shouldn't ever let children buy fighter jets. And that might just be generally um, the reason why they go with the left woods line off the PepsiCo line. And they might also be discussing uh, like the advantages or disadvantages of going with one rule versus the other one. Then I wanted to add in, there might be a dissent which is uh, some judges, if it's a group of judges, like in the Supreme Court, some judges might disagree. So what is the dissent rationale? And then one last thing, we also want to think about our own and your personal evaluation. Like I agree that children should not have fighter jets, or I disagree and all children should have fighter jets, this type of thing. Just think about that as best you can, but it's always important um, to understand what the laws are. I think having that personal connection to them also helps um, quite a bit. Um, and so I want to say, we're going to go into Simmons versus Tice today. I just want to add in, if, if you want to practice these, these are all really fundamental cases in um, law. And so for contracts, there's a few cases, Hawkins versus McGee, Leonard versus PepsiCo. I just want to add in and make sure I spell this right. Just for posterity's sake. Left. Always. These are the ones Celeste was discussing. We didn't quite get into super deeply versus great Minneapolis surplus store. Um, any of these, I would suggest actually trying a couple of these if you're curious about contracts, if you're curious about civil, well, probably not a lot of people are curious about civil procedure, but if you are, uh, we'll go ahead and read this one. These cases are pretty interesting, uh, torts or cases of people suing each other for damages, including, uh, like, uh, products liability and stuff like that. Um, criminal law cases, property cases, or constitutional law cases. I would say tr check these out. You can just Google these, get the quick, uh, get the actual uh, opinion, the legal opinion written out, and, and see if you can apply this uh, on your own and see if you can try to brief these cases on your own. These are very famous cases that you'll almost definitely see the majority of these in law school. Um, so I'm probably going to move on from this. I'm not sure if anyone's necessarily going to write down these all by hand, but I think they'll be online later. And so here's our... Uh, opinion we're going to be getting into. I'm just going to read this out loud. And if we can, maybe someone, maybe we can have people put in the chat what you think, or just kind of think of it in your head. See if you can figure out where the case ID is, what, what the facts are, what the procedural history is, what the issue is, what the party's arguments are, what the rule is, what the holding is, what the rationale. Um, yeah, the holding and what the rationale for that holding is. In this case, there will not be a dissent. And then I'd like, you know, if you can think of it, your own evaluation is always useful. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm just gonna read this out loud to us really quick. And then, uh, oh, I, hope that, I don't know if we're quite running out of time. So let's, how much time do we have? Is this supposed to end at the hour? Um, I'll just go through this now and I can speed up or slow down as necessary, but I don't want to go over my lot of time. If I'm bringing too long. But anyway, let me just dive right in. This is Summers versus Tice. And um, I'll just go straight in. I just like Celeste, <laughs> I also did not, Realized when I first started law school that J meant judge or justice. I just thought everyone was named J, or I did the same as a provider. So here we go. <clears throat> Each of the two defendants appeals from a judgment against them in an action for personal injuries. Pursuant to stipulation, the appeals have been consolidated. <clears throat> Plaintiff's action was against both defendants for an injury to his right eye and face as a result of being struck by birdshot discharged with shotgun. The case was tried by the court without a jury, and the court found that on November 20th, 1945, plaintiff and the two defendants were hunting quail on the open range. Each of the defendants was armed with a 12-gauge shotgun loaded with shells containing seven and a half side shot. Prior to going hunting, plaintiff discussed the hunting procedure with defendants, indicating that they were to exercise care in shooting and to keep in line. In the course of hunting, plaintiff proceeded up a hill, thus planting the hunt placing the hunters at the point of a triangle. The view of defendants with reference to a plaintiff was unobstructed, and they knew his location. Defendant Tice flushed a quail 
which rose in flight to a 10-foot elevation and flew between plaintiff and defendant. Both defendants shot at the quail, shooting in plaintiff's direction. At that time, defendants were 75 yards from plaintiff. One shot struck plaintiff in his eye and another in his upper lip. Finally, it was found by the court that as, as, as the direct result of the shooting by defendants, the shot struck plaintiff as above mentioned and that defendants were negligent in such shooting and plaintiff was not contributorily negligent. The problem presented in this case is whether the judgment against both defendants may stand. It is argued by defendants that they are not joint tort feasors and thus jointly and sever severally liable, as they were not acting in concert, and that there is not sufficient evidence to show which defendant was guilty of the negligence which caused the injuries, the shooting by Tice or that by Simmons. The one shot that enters plaintiff's eye was the major factor in assessing damages, and that shot could not have come from the gun of both defendants. It was from one or the other only. It has been held that where a group of persons are in a hunting party or otherwise engaged in the use of firearms, and two of them are negligent in firing the, in the direction of the third person who is injured thereby, both of those so firing are liable for the injury suffered by the third person, although the negligence of only one of them could have caused the injury. These cases speak of the action of defendants as being in concert um, as the ground of decision, yet it would seem that they are straining the concept to the more reasonable basis appears in Oliver B. Miles. These there, two persons were hunted together, both shot at some partridges, and in so doing, shot across the highway entering plaintiff who was traveling on. The court stated that they were acting in concert and thus both were liable. The court then stated, we think that each is liable for the resulting injury to the boy, although no one could say definitively, definitely who shot it. To hold otherwise, would be to exonerate both from liability, although each was negligent and the injury resulted from such negligence. When we consider the relative position of the parties and the results that would flow if plaintiff was required to pin the injury on one of the defendants only, a requirement that the burden of proof on that subject be shifted to defendants becomes manifest. They are both wrongdoers, both negligent towards plaintiff. They brought about a situation where the negligence of one of them injured the plaintiff, hence it should rest with them to absolve himself if he can. The injured party has been placed by defendants in the unfair position of pointing to which defendant caused the harm. If one can escape, the other may also, and plaintiff is remedyless. Ordinarily, defendants are in a far better position to offer evidence to determine which one caused the injury. This reasoning has recent, recently found favor in this court. In quite an, anal an analogous situation, this court held that a patient injured while unconscious on an operating table in a hospital could hold all or any of the persons who had any connection with the operation, even though he could not select the particular acts by the particular person which held to his disability. Ibarra versus Soundgard. The plaintiff has made out a case when he has produced evidence which gives rise to an inference of negligence, which was the proximate cause of the injury. It is up to the defendants to explain the cause of the injury. The same reason the policy and justice shift the burden to each of the defendants to resolve himself if he can relieving the wrong person of the duty of apportioning the injury to a particular defendant, apply here, where we are concerned with whether a plaintiff is required to supply evidence for the apportionment of damages. If defendants are independent tort feasors and thus each liable for the damage caused by him alone, and at least where the matter of apportionment is incapable of proof, the innocent wronged party should not be deprived of his right to redress. The wrongdoers should be left to work out between themselves and the apportionment. The judgment is affirmed. Okay, so that's not super long, uh, but it, it, it's a lot to take in, right? And I'm not sure if we can really do this in the chat, but does anyone, uh, can anyone kind of identify? Is that, is that too, too difficult to ask in the Someone chat? Someone has written in chat. Someone has okay. written in chat. And I don't think in this uh, format, uh, these students can unmute themselves to okay. volunteer. Okay. So, which we were able to do, we were a little more interactive last time, but we've, Mm -hmm. We're working with technology. It's always fun. Yeah, of course. Uh, <laughs> so I think I think chat's our best bet right now. Yeah. Okay. And, and so by I the way, you asked about yeah. time. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if we go over the hour, the replay will be available. I know some people have to go to class, but I think what you're doing is really valuable. And, you know, if we keep this up for another 20, 30 minutes, I think that's fine. Okay, great. I, I, thank you so much for the, the, that, Celeste. I think all, all I'll try to do here, I'll just kind of try to point out to everyone, and I hope that everyone actually gets a chance to think for themselves on this, um, which parts are which. And uh, 
What if I started up here? I, it's, the problem is I can't quite see, see the chat, so I'm not sure if it's going to work too well. I haven't been able to sign in. Um, yeah. I can see the chat, so I'll read you, if, if you what, can, what yeah. somebody that'd, wrote. Yeah. That'd be great. So Thank we you. So have um, one student here who wrote, part one is the procedural posture. Mm -hmm. that, that's okay. Yeah, this is definitely paragraph one. This. I'm sorry, paragraph one procedural posture. Yeah, great. Thank you, whoever in the chat. Thank you, Celeste. Mm -hmm. That's 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 right. This is going to be the procedural history leading into this. This is what happened before this case. This is two defendants are on are appealing a judgment against them. Perfect. And okay, us. then we have paragraphs two and three some facts of the case. Yeah, this is this is this is going to be facts here. This is specifically what happened that led to this trial. Really good. There was um, three people went out hunting. One walked up here, and the other two, and a bird somehow flew. Um, there's maybe a bird, wings, and feet, and these two shot at the bird. And we don't know which, but one of them hit <laughs> our plaintiff in the eye. And I'm loving this drawing. I'm sorry, Nate. I'm <laughs> loving it. I'm loving no, it. A few more drawing from you. You did drawing in another <laughs> one. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. So then we have this plaintiff here. Now switch to being a sad plaintiff or a missing eye plaintiff. And that's that's how we ended up here. Exactly right. And then did anyone say with this? Oh, yeah, it's the same person. This is one person stab at everything. So if anybody else right. wants to either add or change, you can. Yeah. But we have a paragraph four trial court decision. Is that right? Um, it has been held by a group on a hunting party. This is going to mm -hmm. be um, another rule. It has yeah. been held. It has been held. So that is now a, um, yeah, so that is now a precedent. It has been held. And he doesn't say very clearly, or she, in another case prior. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Someone says uh, each party's argument is that paragraph three, or paragraph three is is does I, I think that there can be a little bit of overlap. I would call this and the mm -hmm. issue in the case, the problem presented in this case, is whether the judgment against both defendants may stand. The arg the judge, the defendants, as you're saying, did argue this. They're not joint toy freezers, uh, but uh, well, I guess. It is both the issue and the defendant's argument, whether they are joint tort feasors. So yeah, there can be yeah, overlap, so unfortunately, there's, there's which is very frustrating. Yeah. Collapse yeah. together. Yeah, I see yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool, cool. Keep them coming, students. This is good. Yeah, this is great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Celeste. Yeah. So if I go back to the original student, um, where what paragraph are we on now? Five? So let's let's, let's number them here. There's be one, two, three. Four. This whole one is five. Okay, one, yeah. Two, so this person put issue, but that's kind of very broad for an issue. An issue is usually pretty narrow. So what's going on in this one? Another word for issue might be like the problem to mm. solve in the case. Okay. And so if anyone can see where that issue is, or if anyone can answer what paragraph five or then six or even this little one, paragraph seven might be. Oh, I guess, is that two separate paragraphs? Let's call this all, let's call this five and let's call this six. And then we'll call okay. it one below seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So let's, I think we need to break down what's going on in paragraph sure. five here. Let's do it. So when the, we're starting with, it's a little bit of a hint. So this one, I, we can get the hints just from the word the judge uses and the judges will often use similar words across the board. Maybe we can come up with a, a list in, in the future. But in this case, in the previous paragraph, we said it has been held. So there's been holdings in previous cases. So this is a precedent or rule um, referring to a previous line of cases. And then here, these cases speak of the action of defendants as being in concert. So this is a line of previous cases or precedents, or perhaps the previous rule that we're going to try to apply here. And then we're given another similar case um, that our judge will then either 
um, apply or distinguish these facts here. If that's clear, yeah. And so then here we're actually kind of given, um, it looks like when we consider, so now we, the judge is specifically talking about this case here. It looks like we start with a policy question or applying the uh, like, like outside principles and not specifically law that if the plaintiff was required to pin the in injury on one of the defendants, and we go back to our diagram here, we don't know who shot that faithful shot. It could have been one, it could have been the other, but it would not be fair to, to ask the plaintiff to say who, because both the defendants are wrongdoers. They both brought about the situation um, that injured the plaintiff. So it should rest with them. They should be the ones to absolve themselves if they can. Thus, um, or in other words, or uh, continuing on that line of thoughts, if one of the defendants can escape liability, the other might also be able to say, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. And then the plaintiff has no remedy. Thus, um, they're saying it's analogous to the Ibarra case. So we're sort, sort of applying this case. And it's then saying these same reasons, moving on to paragraph seven, this is sort of going to be... Uh, I guess I should say these are both something like the court rationale or applying the rules mm -hmm. to the case. And this is sort of the policy rationale plus like the law. So it's a little bit, a little bit of both intermixed here. And then here we have our, this is going to be with uh, paragraph eight, paragraph seven, it's going to be the holding or the final decision. And here, the same reasons of policy and justice. So policy, as just like we pointed out, and justice shift the burden to each of the defense to resolve themselves as we can. I'm not sure if everyone totally understands that. It's not as important as this idea that we're saying these same reasons as in the previous case apply here, where we are concerned with whether plaintiff is required to supply evidence for the apportionment of damages. If, de if defendants are independent tort feasors, um, that means, uh, like, well, it's not as relevant. It's a little bit out of scope of what we're trying to teach here. But I do want to say that the matter of deciding who actually caused the damage is incapable of proof. The innocent wronged party should not be deprived of his or her right to redress. So, in other words, uh, the wrongdoers should be left to work out between themselves any apportionment of damages. So as long as the plaintiff has said, hey, it's the fault of these two people and I don't know who exactly, then it's up to them to try to fight out between themselves who owes the money, regardless, one or both of them or each of them separately owe the money to the plaintiff. The plaintiff has done his or her part, has, has done enough to prove um, that the defendants owe money. Basically, shifting the burden of proof to defendants to say it wasn't me and the plaintiff has already done enough to say it's their negligence, it's their action. It's their fault that I'm injured. So I hope that's kind of clear. I that hope you didn't miss it. That's fantastic. Okay. Can I cover one more issue that I just yes, realized do. came up in this case? It's so mm -hmm. funny because we glossed over the burden shifting issue. And mm -hmm. what the heck does that mean? Like, that's another foreign language term. Right. Right. So here we are. We're in court. We have a plaintiff and a defendant. Normally, in a torts case, a contracts case, the plaintiff has to prove their case. The plaintiff has to show for torts, you'll get it. Negligence is duty, breach, causation, damages. You'll be muttering that in your sleep. Don't worry, you'll get there. But the plaintiff has to show all of these things are met. And here the judge says, ah, ha, ha, ha. If, even if we don't know causation, even if we don't know which party caused the harm, because both of these people were being negligent. Both of them, where does it say that? That they were both wrongdoers, okay? Um, Instead of requiring the plaintiff to prove every one of those points, we're gonna shift it over to the defendant to prove that it wasn't them. You know, instead of saying, you have to prove that defendant A or defendant B was liable for your damage, 
which is usually the burden, meaning what a plaintiff is required to do to make her case. That's usually the burden. We're going to say, uh, uh, instead in this kind of case, we're going to require the defendant, you know, the plaintiff only has to prove it was one of you. It was one of you. And you were both, you both breached a duty and you, uh, and it was definitely one of you. And then the defendants have to say, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. And if they can't prove it, they have to fight it out between themselves. Uh, this is unusual to shift the burden of proof, right? But there are some rules in the various subjects, and this is a rule in tort that has a burden shifting effect. And a lot of defenses to torts and defenses to contracts will have burden shifting effects. So that's kind of, yeah, I think it's sort of wow too, but we don't, I think it was buried for, for me and for Nate the first time looking through this case because- Absolutely. It's part of the language we now speak, but we're trying to, you know, unpack yeah. everything for you. And even as I'm discussing how we're, we're trying to learn this new language now, I've totally skipped over the fact that that's probably a term that other people don't even know. I've it's totally slipped my mind. So I definitely understand the hurdles that everyone has to go through and how it's even hard to, um, some of your law professors might not always catch that. So it's important to, to kind of independently study and make sure you get some of yeah. this stuff on your own. Now, we promised to talk about briefing today. So can you briefly talk about the formats oh, for briefing yeah. that I, you I recommend? To, yeah. And I'm going to grab a book. I'm going to grab oh. a literal case book because you know what kind of briefing I do. So mm -hmm. I'll be back exactly. in a second. So I just want to, uh, I, I didn't quite say it, but uh, just fits right in with the things we're looking to identify in a case are these things. Right at the top, we have the case idea, here, the caption. And I think uh, Celeste also covered that as well. But we want to kind of, uh, these are the things we look for and we kind of want to maybe add to a brief. And it doesn't have to be every single one of these every single time. But uh, you might want to open a Google Doc and just say, you know, what, uh, um, give yourself bullets or numbers and say, um, Summers versus Tyson, uh, SBT, and then add in bullets. So what was the, uh, the facts, the procedural history, the issue, um, the holding, the rationale, any one of these that is applicable, go ahead and add it to your uh, Google document. Then you'll get another case right below it and you have tons of cases by the time you're finished with the semester. But at the end of the day, you want this information in your briefing because um, you'll then condense this information later on. Some um, Summers versus Tice stands for the, the rule, you know, about burden shifting and this and that and when a plaintiff um, what, what happens in joint tort feasors, uh, joint separately liable. This is not as relevant, but they, they kind of end up standing for different rules with different facts. And as you're reading a case, you might want to read it the first time, but you're not going to catch everything the first time. So you kind of have to read it once, and then the second time, you have to read the brief. Like, oh, now I, re I realize these are the facts. This is the procedural history. These are the issues and this type of stuff. And then I would often look it up online um, I read, look it up in a book. What did I miss? What, what types of things was I supposed to catch that I didn't catch? And then I might just the first few times of briefing, although I don't think everyone has time for this, you might want to read it a third time and just skim like, okay, and just immediately apply what you've learned, which is applying this idea that that's what facts look like. That's what procedural history looks like, this and that. Um, and then you'll keep getting better and keep getting better. And this, uh, this process kind of goes faster in the future. Um, some people like to take notes within a book, book briefing, where you just write directly on the book, but you don't want to take those notes the very first time you read the case. You definitely want to wait until at least the second time. And some people write, uh, use highlighters like green for the issue, yellow for the facts, this type of stuff. That wouldn't work for me because I think I would accidentally mess it up, but I do know people who that works for. Yes. Okay. So when I talk to Nate about, you know, thinking back to our law school experience and even how we read legal sources now, um, back then, I think both of us kind of would type our briefs into our notes as we went along through the semester, but certainly Nate kept that up and that worked for him throughout, you know, law school when he needed to prepare for class, he would have those bullet points, you know, facts, procedure, issue holding, um, Should I unshare my screen to us? Um, what's that? 
Should I unshare my screen for you? Oh yeah, let's do that. And then we'll see, see your face again. We had to actually turn off your camera because it was an odd angle when you were sharing your screen. Okay. You yeah. Thank you for turning that off for me. I didn't even realize that type of stuff. Yeah. No, Katie and I took care of that. Um, yeah, there you are. Hi, good to Thank see you. you. I love how we're both in a law library. It's like we're talking yeah. to each I other. I think we're in the same library, actually. I think, I, I think yeah. you're at the end. Of right, exactly. We're just talking yeah. to each other. You've got the mm -hmm. tables behind you. I love it. It's so fake and so funny. <laughs> um, you know, um, but as you get more adept at reading, this is how I read now. I want to show you how I read now. Like literally... This is one of the books I taught from as a law professor. And I was called on two weeks notice to teach a course I hadn't looked at in um, four years. Uh, and I went to that law school and uh, taught that course. And uh, it was property. I love teaching property, but I hadn't even looked at it in four years. Right. And so I am picking up this property case book and I am reading it fast. You know, I had an old syllabus. I, I said, okay, this is how I'm going to do it. I had co-taught the course before. So even just teaching it all the way through two semesters, first time, first time reading like so much of the casebook, creating my syllabus. everything. Right. Okay. So when I have to read fast, this is what it looks like. Okay. I have, oh man, I got that thing going on. I'm going to have to turn off this. Um, yeah. I'm going to, virtual background none so we're going to go back to my boring home office but you know it's so funny but you can see I've got things scribbled on the side of the page I've got my notes right here for me they are in pencil why my initial judgments could be wrong I could change my mind um that is what terrifies me about book briefing look at all that I'll scribble if I note something and I have a big old thing here with an arrow rule <laughs> I'm not even kidding this is me as a law professor a big old you know word rule with an arrow exactly where I wanted it to go notes about the parties sellers m h two lots in earlier sale a little diagram of who's granting what to whom which is really helpful in property that's just one case and I see that I scribbled all over this book. This book is full of scribbling. You know, I mean, I'm just showing this to you to show it looks ridiculous. It's the ravings of a mad woman, but it helped me to understand the material. The, if you do transition to a more book-based method, I, I urge you, if you underline or highlight anything, put a little note as to why in the margin. Because if you've got a whole bunch of stuff that's underlined or highlighted, and then you're looking for the good stuff, you, you end up going back and rereading it again. And if you're preparing for class this way, maybe next semester, after you've gotten good at it, um, you want to be able to find stuff. Which is why a lot of people do that rainbow briefing that, that Nate was talking about earlier, where they use a highlighter to say, okay, here's the holding, here's the facts. Here's some reasoning. And they use different colors of highlighter. What terrifies me about that is that highlighter is not erasable. So what if you were wrong? <laughs> I don't understand how they do it. But for the people who also, I'm just going to admit, I'm one of those people who would lose the green highlighter, like by the second week of school. And my whole system would be thrown off. I'm not the most organized person. And especially in law school, I was not. But um, so that didn't work for me. But the fact is, it worked for some students who used it. At the same time, um, I remember buying a book back from a student at the end of the year, I wanted an extra copy. So I just bought it back from one of my students. Um, so I could put it on reserve in the library, because I realized some of my students couldn't afford to buy the book at the very beginning of the year. So just put it on reserve in the library. I did that. So I asked somebody to bring me a, you know, a pretty clean copy of the book. And the student who got to me first, totally clean, barely touched it at all. He had one of the highest grades in my class. So he used a method more like Nate's where his briefs were constantly in his notes. That's how he kept track of stuff was only through his notes. And he was able to sell back his book, you know, clean, clean, clean right? So you don't have to scribble in the book. You have to figure out what works for you. 
um, in terms of a briefing process. So I hope today was helpful. We are here to help you learn the language of the law, to guide you through this foreign country that is the first year of law school. And um, just to show you again, I'll show you on the computer this time. Um, we have, oh no, this is bar exam. Anyway, I showed you earlier, we have one L. It's a product that we um, offer that has, um, you know, some extra study materials, including flashcards and um, commercial case briefs. There's no substitute for reading a case on your own to actually understand the reasoning, uh, but sometimes it can be good to confirm if you got it right um, or to look at another case in the area. But, um, but yeah, all of that is available. And then a lot of practice essays and practice multiple choice, all available within the BarMax um, I'm sorry, the, the one L app, you can go to the app store and just look for it. One L that's what it's called. The number one, the letter L there's a free version, or you can sign up for a seven day trial. If you are interested in tutoring, you can contact us, reach out to test max and set up some tutoring. So we are very glad you attended uh, we hope these workshops are helpful and we will have more coming up in the coming months. Take care. And Nate, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your, your clear, helpful explanations. Bye, everyone.